Thank you very much for that introduction. My name is Tara Bernhope and today I'm going to give you an overview of high pressure chronic retention. And then we're going to look more specifically at post-obstructive diuresis, what it is, why it happens and how we manage it. High pressure chronic retention is characterised by a residual volume of greater than 800 mils and this causes renal impairment secondary to bilateral hydronephrosis. The intravocycle pressure I'll come on to in a moment. Clinically, the patient may still be voiding. They may not notice that they have any urinary symptoms whatsoever, and that's because this is a condition that's built up over time, and so the bladder has um, increased in capacity and, and adjusted to that. Another presentation is patients may describe nocturnal bedwetting, and that's because the uh, resting tone of the sphincter is reduced during sleep. It's a painless condition, although if there is a super added insult, uh, such as a urinary tract infection, then an acute on chronic picture uh, may present, which can be painful. So the bladder is retaining an ever increasing amount of urine after voiding. And so at the end of a void, there is an increased intravocycle pressure. And when the bladder then fills, the pressure rises even further. There's a great paper from Professor Abrams um, from the 70s, which where he performs urodynamics on um, a, a cohort of patients with retention and splits them into low pressure and high pressure groups. So the normal rise in detrusor pressure from an empty bladder to full capacity should be less than 15 centimetres of water. And he found that the mean increase uh, in detrusor pressure in the high pressure group was 85 centimetres of water. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no universal definition. Um, there's no numerical value for uh, diagnosis of um, a high pressure retention, although some textbooks talk about an intravocycle pressure greater than 30 centimetres of water. Um, so that's just to give you a bit of an idea of, um, of the difference that we're talking about here. Hopefully there's nothing on this slide that surprises you. The acute management of high pressure chronic retention is prompt catheterization and expect very large volumes in the order of litres. The most I've seen is a patient retaining four litres. To always document the residual volume, document clearly that the catheter must not be removed and explain these points to the rest of your team and to the patient as well. Um, in particular, explain to the patient that decompression hematuria is likely, um, as that can be quite a frightening uh, thing to observe if you're not expecting it. And definitive management, I'm not going, going to go into, um, but it's either long-term catheterization, intermittent self-catheterization, or some sort of outflow surgery. Moving on now to post-obstructive diuresis, and this is defined as a urine output of greater than 200 mils per hour for two consecutive hours. There is a physiological component and there may be a pathological component also. The physiological diuresis is a normal physiological response to the volume expansion and solute accumulation that occurs during obstruction. Sodium, urea and free water are eliminated and as, the, as fluid homeostasis is restored, the diuresis ends. A pathological diuresis may then ensue, and that's characterised by inappropriate renal handling of water or solutes or both. There are a number of mechanisms by which a pathological diuresis can occur. There is defective generation of the medullary solute gradient, secondary to reduced reabsorption of sodium chloride by the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, and reduced reabsorption of urea by the collecting tubule. There's also an inability to maintain the solute gradient because of increased medullary blood flow, and this causes a solute washout. There's also increased endogenous production of atrial natriuretic peptide, causing a saline diuresis, and a poor response of the collecting duct to antidiuretic hormone. All of this can result in a worsening renal impairment and electrolyte abnormalities, the most common being hyponatremia. 
Now I'm going to talk about the management of high pressure chronic retention once the patient has had a catheter inserted, remembering that we need to be vigilant for a post-obstructive diuresis. So the first step is that these patients need to be monitored very closely. Um, they need hourly urine output monitoring and monitoring of their fluid inputs. They need a minimum of four hourly observations, including heart rate and lying and standing blood pressure to look for any hemodynamic instability um, and postural drop and they need daily weights, again, to look for any gross fluid shifts. Similarly, urea and electrolyte blood tests need to be taken regularly, and the patient may need a venous blood gas um, to assess for acidosis as well. Depending on the level of the renal impairment, this may need to be multiple times a day. Hopefully, by the time that you're seeing the patient as a urologist, they will have had some upper tract imaging, to assess for any other cause of renal impairment. Medication review is something that um, can sometimes fall to the bottom of the list, um, but it's important to check that the patient is not on any nephrotoxics, diuretics, antihypertensives that may be making the situation worse. And also PPIs, um, it's important to remember that they can exacerbate a hyponatremia, so you may need to stop that temporarily. Where a diuresis has been identified, fluid needs to be, re be replaced at a rate lower than the urine output. The literature varies with recommendations to replace, um, some say 50%, can uh, other papers say up to 90% of the urine output over the following hour. Uh, additionally, the literature suggests 0.45% sodium chloride. However, in practice, we often use normal saline 0.9%. Um, as it's more readily available. My current practice is to give half of the preceding hour's urine output over that hour. So, for example, if the patient voided 500 mils over the previous hour, I would give 250 mils of normal saline over the following hour. And, and this would need to be adjusted accordingly. Giving too much fluid um, can perpetuate the diuresis. If things aren't going to plan, don't be afraid to escalate to your friendly local nephrologist, uh, particularly if you have a prolonged diuresis greater than 48 hours um, or worsening renal function or persistent electrolyte abnormalities that you're failing to control with conservative measures. Uh, these patients may require um, specialist fluid regimes or renal replacement therapy in the worst case scenarios. Finally, I just want to mention a few scenarios where um, you should be very alert to the prospect of post-obstructive diuresis in these groups of patients. Patients who are fluid overloaded with congestive heart failure, peripheral edema, hypertension, patients with severe renal impairment, or patients who have CNS symptoms that are commonly associated with hyponatremia, um, so malaise, nausea, headache, irritability and confusion. So to conclude, my take home messages for this talk are that the first step of management of post-obstructive diuresis is recognising the problem. These patients need very close monitoring and you may need to impress the importance of that upon the rest of your team. Caution those patients with fluid overload, severe renal impairment and CNS symptoms as they are the most likely to have a poor prognosis. Thank you very much. I hope you found this useful.